Are you there, Algorithm Jesus? It's me, Michael. If you can hear me, the title of this episode is... All-time film ranking greatest best movie Pokemon Fortnite Spider-Man also makeup tutorial crisis actors fade five film movies Mikey Jordan the tier list. I just spruce it up so people actually see this video show up in their subscriptions. Film joints gotta eat everybody like and subscribe. Some people uh, need, need to be told that I get. I don't, man. I wanted to do something that challenged me as a film writer. How do movies hold up over time to us, to the world? I've been making Fave 5 episodes for over seven years now. The thought occurred to us, what if we took all those selections and pitted them against each other in a tournament where a winner must be chosen? Just have some fun because the world's ending and the job I apparently chose was, uh, video essayist. But hey, somebody's got to... Play the ship down into the water. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Part one will be the west side of the bracket. Part two will be the east side of the bracket. Part three will be the playoffs. This will be three weeks in a row. Some of the matchups are frighteningly thematic and some are, I'll just show you in a second. We ran this as if it was a real 32 team basketball tournament and the seeds were assigned based on American box office. Ultimately, the winner of any matchup is decided on what the piece brought to cinema and how it affected filmmaking as a whole. I'll show my work here, but there are of course two anomalies, let's call them wild cards. We only included two selections from 2020, Palm Springs and Ted Lasso, mostly because I thought it would be uh, funny. I thought making Ted Lasso a wild card in a tournament was humorous. I thought it would spice uh, it up. I didn't even stop to think about what the top seeded movie in this tournament even was. <laughs> To be blunt, I think there are a multitude of reasons that Force Awakens doesn't hold up so hot over time, and yeah, one of them is Fortnite. How could I possibly pick Force Awakens here? Is there a support group for people who talked about Star Wars on the internet? Can I start one? At the end of the day, in the year of our glorb 2021, I think Ted Lasso brought more joy to the world and inarguably less vitriol. Ted Lasso was this breath of fresh air in the second half of 2020 where it felt like the oxygen was starting to leave the room. And honestly, it was at a time where Star Wars was starting to suck the oxygen out of the room. In an upset against the number one seed, the winner of the first fight is... Ted Lasso. Sure, yeah, this one's a TV show and not a movie, but the hell if 2021 doesn't need a wild card about a group of people that actually enjoy helping each other to, you know, get better. First fight goes to Ted Lasso by knockout. Okay, this one seems like a might simpler decision. I have a soft spot for In Bruges. I think Martin McDonough is a vital voice in modern cinema. I don't think it will come as much of a surprise to say that three billboards didn't appear to absorb into the zeitgeist much. I know some people found it an understandably challenging movie, to put it mildly. Having said that, who could choose anything other than the earth-moving precision with which Bong Joon-ho made his capitalism critical masterpiece Parasite? just in a whole world by himself. There's a precision to the performances and there's this way that the camera always seems to match that intensity. Parasite is a film where the exactness of its presentation is one of the things creating the tension. Bong Joon-ho comes out of fight number two on top. If you haven't checked out Parasite yet, I don't think I could recommend it any more highly. Parasite wins by technical knockout in the second round. In this corner, fighting in disturbingly featureless white clothes, the frank meditation on the emotional effects of trauma and gaslighting, 
M -m -m Midsummer, and they are facing off against the full-throated love letter to Dame Four First Names, Agatha Mary Clarissa Christie. Knives, knives out. Somehow this is already the most potent film exercise I've done. You actually have to resonate with the film on its own terms. Knives Out and Midsummer are films both equally about cruelty and the protective concealment of it. Let me rephrase. Most of the characters in both movies do their damnedest to set the narrative around them. It's sort of a crazy festival. Special ceremonies and dressing up. Bus killed him. One of his no, family no, Walt, Walt, killed him. No, Is that Walt. what you're suggesting, Lieutenant? Both are shot with an eye for detail, keeping the viewer searching the frame for any way out of this helpless feeling. One's funny, though. Um, yeah, the other one has a, a bear guy. To choose a winner here, I think you have to look at their contributions to modern cinema beyond story and narrative because they both tell their stories extremely effectively. Both films were shot on digital, though one film went out of its way to emulate the comfort imperfections of film. Gateweave and, and all that. I did, there's a, and not that the performances in Midsummer were anything other than powerhouses, but it seems almost criminal to put any cast up against the cast of Knives Out. It is an embarrassment of riches. Hashtag Jamie Lee Curtis doesn't have an Oscar. Hashtag yes, it's a crime. Here we had two thrillers where the deciding factor was really what they brought to the art form beyond their expression. Knives Out comes out ahead in round three of the prelims largely on the earth-moving work of Steve Yedlin. But that's why filmmaking is a team sport. Knives Out takes it home in the waning seconds of the 11th round. The referee had to stop the fight. See, algorithm man. I'm using the boxing metaphor to create nuance and emotional investment with an audience that will engender interaction. Man, 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 man. Alex Garland versus David Fincher, the stellar writer versus the most precise visual filmmaker on the market. Gone Girl is a great and enjoyable little corker that reveals some heinous truths about the human condition. Also, Ben Affleck is fantastic in it. No high perbs, real truth. I think if you've watched my show before, you probably have a good inkling that Ex Machina might come out on top here because answering questions about the human struggle through the filmic metaphor of creating artificial intelligence and discussing what rights a sentient being has is extremely my speed. I mean, Ex Machina asks the toughest questions that will become more relevant as we enter our future. You can't make things think and not give them rights. I know, total brain tornado, bro. Alex Garland is exceptionally good at setting up rent free in my brain after he makes something. I thought about Ex Machina months after I saw it. Gone Girl didn't really stick to my soul in quite the same way. Also, Ava is a special effects marvel, so there it is. Ex Machina by Knockout in the sixth round. And Oscar Isaac is in the front row dancing. This is the fight for the ages. Taika Waititi versus uh, tiny Lego people. That's pay-per-view shit. This matchup is hard because both were breakout movies for both of its filmmakers. I think difficulty increases when the filmmaker is Taika Waititi and his follow-up to this is going to rewrite the rules and what a big budget studio tenpole can be. They're both films I greatly enjoy watching. I've rewatched both movies a huge number of times. Comparing the filmmaking paths between Lord and Miller and Taika Waititi is a pretty tough brain smoothie because you see how fast both of these separate movie making titans took over Hollywood in entirely different ways. So forget all that and let's just jump into the weeds for a moment because there is no time of day where I am not in the mood to watch both of these movies. They both make me feel stuff and shit. On its most heartfelt level, the Lego movie is an homage to the old Lego stop motion videos of yore. It's like the wildest and most expensive version of that original idea, obviously made in CG. Oh my gosh! Uh, pow. Wow. And it's a super stylistic reimagining of a stop motion art form from the early days of the internet. Lego movies kind of blew up as a brand 
because like Ninjago or whatever, but the Lego movie was a movie that spoke directly against nostalgia breaking a dude's brain to the point that he won't let his own son experience joy. The Lego movie. Winner by friendship in the 12th round. Roger Deakins versus Bradford Young. Though hilariously, I guess it's Dunny Villanov versus Dunny Villanov. I guess Roger Deakins is the undercard, maybe? I, The metaphor is kind of getting away from me a little bit now. This is two gorgeous celebrations of the cinematic medium. The sound design and photography in Sicario is pound for pound the biggest bang for your buck in the industry. If you upgrade your home theater, might I suggest you demo this movie to your friends? It's the most gorgeous, ugly movie you'll ever see. However, you already know what I'm going to say before I say it. Arrival is one of the best films ever made, full stop. It exists entirely in its own space and follows entirely its own rules. Arrival is about the disconnected nature of human emotion, how the circumstances that surround us give us alternate perspective. You know, in the face of alien invasion. Arrival to this day is one of the most profound pieces of filmmaking I've ever seen. Amy Adams deserves a makeup oopsie Oscar. Arrival wins by temporally unclear knockout in the 12th and somehow also first rounds. Two pseudo-biographical stories from two entirely different time periods are about to go to the ring and uh, talk, talk a lot. Let's talk about the big sick real quick. The script from Mary Powerhouse's Kamel Nanjiani and Emily V. Gordon and directed by one Michael Showalter, it was immensely touching and extremely funny in refreshingly creative yet disarmingly honest ways. And a girl, I only have sex once on the first date. I'm just gonna <laughs> call an Uber. Your driver will be ready as soon as he puts on his pants. And at the same time, I also absolutely adored Greta Gerwig's fresh take on Little Women. I love the script, I love the performances, and I love the way it reframed a classic story in a way that enlightened other things about that story and that time period. It's infectiously clever. And I'm, to use the parlance of the film industry, killing a darling on this one. I hope we see a renaissance of people thinking about how to adapt classic literature in new and brilliant ways. But I have to go with my heart here. The Big Sick wins by decisive knockout in the 10th round. Though, however, the judging results were called into question and the results are under internal investigation by the overzealous boxing metaphor association. And tonight's main event mostly because it's at the bottom of the bracket this is 28th seed versus the fifth seed stop attacking my sports metaphor where do you even start with the final matchup of today bo burnham's directorial debut against edgar wright's fifth major studio film i'm curious to see over time where baby driver ends up in the conversation in the long run I was mildly disappointed with how that film was received originally, and by that I mean people talking about what they didn't like in the film without engaging with the film's extremely blatant messaging on disability. Also, it was the maiden voyage of Darkwing docking people, so Baby Driver will live in my heart forever. I think 8th Grade is a fantastic debut from Burnham. After Inside, I hope he never stops making movies. He's an exceptional talent. 8th Grade makes you feel that desperation again. From the music, to the writing, to the performances, to the editing, it is a confident, small story played entirely genuine. Yeah. I concurrently think Baby Driver is a wild filmmaking swing that is somehow both a riveting car movie yet somehow also a cute little musical about feeling twitterpated all the time. Timeless by design at almost every level. These films traded blows all the way to the end. 
This fight went to the judges, but Baby Driver managed to come out ahead. Both are absolutely worth the second look, but to the surprise of absolutely no one, I'm going with Baby Driver and Edgar Wright here. I had a profound experience with it. I know not everyone had that same experience. It's about more than it might appear on the surface, but outside of that, it's just a hell of a ride. Hope you watched part one. It's right there if you need it. We got quite the bracket today in the East. Hey, remember how the first match last time was almost too esoteric for a comparison? Oh boy. Disney held down the top two seeds in this tournament. If anything, they are really good at creating moments in time. Moments we'll remember. Nostalgia for Disney is designed into your life from birth. Sorry, that was too serious. Let me grab my boxing metaphor microphone. Hang on. Uh... In the blue corner, the captivating dissertation on the grim specter of colonialism. Ba 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 Black Panther. Taking on the titan of superhero cinema is. And Andy Samberg. Okay, wait, hang on. New approach. Both of these movies were timely reflections of the moment they came from. Palm Springs was like water in the desert known as 2020. I don't think art can be more timely than July 10th, 2020. How are you doing that day? I'll tell you, very bad. You were very sad that day. But I have no intention of burying the lead here. This isn't a difficult choice as much as I loved Palm Springs. What Ryan Coogler achieved with Black Panther is nothing shy of monumental. A film where the villain isn't the other guy, it's the scars of, uh... The cast is incredible, it's such a fully realized world, and it was a singular moment in time that has passed. Black Panther was a landmark, an astonishing swing that met the moment that surrounded it. Winner by incredibly complex triple backflip knockout in the second round. Wakanda forever. Oh, god damn it. Okay. Um. 10 Cloverfield Lane gave the world Dan Trachtenberg. What a career! 10 Cloverfield Lane is one of the best bottle movies ever made. Read absolutely nothing if you haven't seen it, just go watch it right now. It is Hitchcock in a bottle. But let's talk about Spike. Up against one of the most legendary filmmakers working today on one of the best films they've ever made, I gotta go with Spike Lee in this fight. God bless white America. Produced by none other than Jordan Peele here. I appreciate that Spike is always trying different things. He forces conversations, and he's been doing that since 1989. You the man. No, you the man. No, you the man. No, you the man. I, I don't love his current 9-11 opinions, but I love this piece of art. I love all the people that brought this wonderful story together. There's never been a black cop in this city. We think you might be the man to open things up around here. Black Klansman is a tonal masterpiece about racism in America. You'll laugh, you'll cry. It is a damn funny movie about the past that is rendered frighteningly prescient by its framing. An absolute goddamn masterpiece and just enjoyable as hell. Spike Lee comes out on top in an extremely tough match. The fight went five rounds. Winner by knockout with a side of America's problematic infatuation with Adam Driver is Black Klansman. The next one can't possibly be this. Fury Road has always been an extremely personal film to me. Don't you, don't you dare. Hey, could I get some like weird atonal underwater baits? Oh my gosh, how did you have that ready?
It's a film that I've seen mean a lot of different things to a lot of people. It is a piece of filmmaking so profound within an industry of uniformity and benign gambles that absolutely no one has been able to mimic it. Fury Road stands alone. George Miller absolutely redefined what films for children could look like and he just strolls back up to the action cinema plate with a franchise that he hasn't touched in film in 30 years and well cowabunga dude here's a good metaphor to frame this no one hits a home run at their own hall of fame induction ceremony there is no question that fury road is gonna win here so i want to take advantage of my time i want to talk about nightcrawler for 30 seconds it's an incredible film and I think it deserves revisiting. Dan Gilroy put together an exceptional takedown about the weaknesses in a for-profit news system and who is most likely to take advantage of those weaknesses. This was 2014. Watch the movie now and let me know how it lands. In the comments down below, I'll show myself how far. Lewis Bloom has no story. He simply appears, and sometimes he blinks, but only when he needs to put the mask back on. Fury Road obviously won by murder uppercut in the first round, but rewatching Nightcrawler put ghost chills inside of my bones. Morning news, if it bleeds, it leads. Are you currently hiring? Battle of the TV Boys. Okay, that's, that sounded way tougher in my head. Both of these film casts are incredible, and both films will keep you frozen in place with a clenched jaw for their entire runtime. Boom, bar for comparison achieved with tremendous existential stress. Just kidding, it's 2021. That's all there is. <laughs> Bad Times at the El Royale is an achievement. Drew Goddard wrote for Lost, Buffy, Alias, he directed Cabin in the Woods. Speakerphone, no, no, I wouldn't do that. Yes, I am. I, I can hear the echo. El Royale was a different gear for him. The film is a wonderfully textured bunch of bad guys in a hotel movie with impeccable casting. You absolutely cannot go wrong with this cast. No matter how long it takes now, how many heartaches must I stay before I find a love? But Get Out changed the game for what a directorial debut could look like. Get Out made a quarter of a billion dollars. It is visually arresting and weaves one hell of a dark and twisted tale. This movie haunted me. On some level, it is still haunting me. And when this fight eventually moved to the sunken place, Get Out was at a pretty direct advantage. Get Out wins by knockout inside of the ethereal prison known as the seventh round. On paper, this is the 30th seed in the tournament taking on number three, Guardians of the Galaxy. Five heroic beings from multiple worlds join forces against um, this quaint, tiny Irish coming of age musical with the best soundtrack the 80s never made. Is it? Am I even talking words? Drive It Like You Stole It is still at the top of the all time bop tier list. I think we forget how much of a gamble hiring the writer of Tromeo and Juliet and direct a movie about a comic that the movie going population at large was generally unaware of at the time. A torch James picked up from Nicole Perlman who had worked on Guardians for years at Marvel before he came on board. Most Marvel movies were still like, ah fooey, our flimsy government infrastructure has been taken over by squid. Squid Nazis. 
Guardians of the Galaxy is a mammoth success. Phase 2 Marvels started going in some really interesting directions, but also th uh, Thor 2. Guardians convinced a lot of people to care about a tree and a raccoon. And also, uh, Glenn Close and John C. Riley show up in this movie. It's, it's, as comic book movie difficulty levels go, I'm having trouble thinking of a harder assignment than adapting Guardians of the Galaxy. James Gunn hit a remarkable and unmistakable home run. I love this movie. It still gets me every time. Winner by Space Gun Kata in the 11th round, Guardians of the Galaxy. The feather adorned orange corner of the ring, fighting at 5'8 in sequin board shorts behind a piano, is the one and only Rocket Man! And fighting in the muted color palette corner with sardonic wit and palpable ennui, Lady Bird! <clears throat> I hurt my throat. Both of these films occupied my mind for a period of time. Rocket Man stuck with me more than most. I think it takes a lot of strength to put your life out there like Elton did. Rocket Man internally needs to have a moment of liftoff, and this movie does, and it's beautiful. Sure, some of the scenes are a little overly sentimental, but a strikingly coherent study of a man out of order. Which brings us to Lady Bird, a film that treads familiar terrain in strikingly honest ways. I want you to be the very best version of yourself that you can be. What if this is the best version? I somehow equally relate to both of these movies. Both of these films have killer soundtracks, extremely strong central performances, but a script like Lady Bird's comes along once in the bluest moon. We're gonna be talking about Lady Bird for decades. I cannot expect everybody to do everything. <laughs> There's a loneliness to Lady Bird that cannot be understated, though the movie will try repeatedly to understate it. Late in the 12th round, the fighters could barely stand up. It was Rocket Man who fell to the mat first, leaving Lady Bird standing alone in the center of the ring. Winner by technical knockout. This one was an interesting film experience to revisit. I think Burban holds up better than it did before, and I think La La Land has aged like an old sock. Having said that, I am madly in love with Damien Chazelle as a filmmaker. And the Academy Award. <laughs> for Best Picture. Birdman is almost too meta at this point, it has practically taken on an entirely second meaning. If I may indulge myself for a moment, <coughs> Birdman or the unexpected virtue of ignorance weaves an explosive tale that the Wikipedia entry takes some swings at, but ultimately fails to recognize the subtext of the film uh, is the unsubtlest Batman metaphor of all time. It was interesting in film to question what happens to our silver screen superheroes when they move on to differing stages of their lives. The movie floored me originally. I thought about Michael Keaton for weeks. We do just toss Batman's aside like garbage. You're right! And then we design multiverses, which I will remind you is the exact same mistake the comics industry made the first time their industry collapsed and then you, you gotta cram it all back together. Batman is so meta at this point, we'll have to invent new words for films like this. Let's make a comeback. Technical Marvel is an understatement for this movie. Alejandro Iñárritu is a magician and an incandescent beacon for cinema. Birdman throws a haymaker in the second round. Winner by knockout. And now for today's main event. Okay, this one doesn't feel fair, I'm sorry. I'd say for the most part, seeding the selections based on domestic box office actually worked, you know, uh, pretty well. But on this one, it probably reads as... 
I talked at length about the dizzying bar that the Spider-Man team went to bring a vibrancy and immediacy to comic book movies that had been sorely missing. Spider-Verse celebrates the art of the comic book medium through the cinematic medium. An incredible achievement that I am almost 100% certain that Hollywood took only wrong lessons from. I think Spider-Verse probably caused the metaverse hell we're all about to endure, but that's neither here nor there. Room is a tiny movie. I want a different story! No, this is the story that you get! It's the story of two people in an impossible situation and these two actors put on a clinic for the runtime. A movie that absolutely won't sit with you the same way after 2020. Lamp. It is a harrowing film that will stick with you after. Brie Larson should have been the biggest star on the planet after this. Comic books ruin that too, I guess. But in the end, Into the Spider-Verse won by incandescent pop art explosion in the first round, knocking out not only their opponent, but the entire audience as well. Years making this show. Art, cinema, brave tentacles. Wait, what? Oh. We wanted to do something different this time. Video essay? Movie tournament? Words don't mean anything, allegedly. Our society exists post word. The age, age of, of emojis, emojis has dawned. I guess what I'm saying is this was fun. I liked doing it. Due to the mammoth size of the finale, we have split that episode into two parts. So this is part one, which will be the round of 16, and then it's all the way in in the next episode in one week. In the red corner. Gosh darn it is a show ten times more nuanced than I think people believed it would be in the first place. Th -th 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 Corner is a, is a film, and this is a movie competition. We all had our fun at Star Wars' expense, but Ted's not walking away from a fave film fight with Bong Joon-ho's freakishly precise masterwork. Video essays feel like they were invented for this movie. I will never look at a pizza box the same way again. Look, we have a lot of fights to get through, and the first fight goes to Parasite in the third round, winner by technical knockout, Godspeed, Theodore. In the knife corner, fighting in houndstooth shorts and starring Daniel Craig in easily his best role uh, 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 ever. No, 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 knives out. And in the sentient care of good corner is the movie that still keeps me up on some nights. Ex Machina! This is why I wanted to do this tournament, to force myself to choose favorites in a weird movie tournament, comma, video essay. Uh, Just the way he looks at me, that gentle love and stare. Something I've always wanted to talk about with Knives Out but never really got the chance is how it reflects precisely the moment we're living through right now. Every aspect of online discourse toxicity is represented here in the characters. One of the characters is a purposeful stand-in for Star Wars trolls, a thing Ryan Johnson had mild to moderate experience with. Knives Out comes from a very deep somewhere. It's a celebration of Agatha Christie and the mystery genre in film, sure, but it's also a movie about entitlement becoming weaponized. Welcome to the Roaring Twenties. They're both movies that paint pretty dire illustrations of our current human experiment. 
Ex Machina may have been a special effects marvel, but Knives Out is going to change how we make movies far into the future. I'm elated the sequels are going to Netflix because maybe Steve Yedlin can teach them how to make all their movies not look exactly the same. <laughs> I'm sorry Netflix, I'm really excited for war. don't be mad at me. Knives Out is the stone cold winner by knifing their opponent more than they themselves were knifed. The fight went the knife distance, Adieu, Oscar Isaac dancing in the front row, our sweet summer prince, gone too young. But we awake tomorrow to kill again. Wait. Okay, I'm not even sure this is words. Come on, Michael. Okay, Lego Movie is an exploration of Lego through the lens of nostalgia that is actually critical of the brand itself. There is no wrong way to Lego. Unless it's Ninjago! Hey! Arrival, concurrently to the Plastic Brick Majesty, is a film composed of endless beauty and contemplative yearning. Also, Alien, aliens, both, okay, it's both things. Arrival tells its story. It's a wonderful, beautiful tale of loss told on a grand and expansive stage. Something truly magical happened with both films, but Arrival is just another gear of filmmaking. Staggering photography from Bradford Young, Amy Adams out here inventing emotional states. She ceases to be a human and yet remains wholly empathetic. Louise is the best. I'm sorry we are saying goodbye to our Lego friends, but in the eighth round, somebody's little legs got tired. And of course, heptapods have six legs. It, you know, winner by tearing the Legos apart with their minds and stuff is a rival in the seventh round. Um, oh, uh, oh no, um, make it, make it, make it stop. Is this, is this? The Big Sick and Baby Driver are both great for wildly different reasons. The Big Sick wasn't afraid to tell its own story, funny, heartbreaking, honest. It's a wonderful film. Go watch it. No, I you play it. You can't rhyme it. You try to find a word that nobody can rhyme. Okay. And Stonehenge. Is... Yeah, so you would win. Yeah. Okay, having said that, comma, Baby Driver Slaps. A great little crime movie with some bananas-ass camera and stunt work and a killer soundtrack. Edgar Wright paints a picture of a couple of kids who just want to get out. A feel-good musical car movie uh, with guns. A feel-good musical car movie with guns. I like it when filmmakers flex different muscles. Maybe it's a big deal when thoughtful creative directors don't get sucked up into the Marvel machine. Tequila. Baby Driver is winner by musically motivated knockout just after the second chorus, but before the bridge. Okay, this one's gonna sting. Partly because I know I gotta say goodbye to a really good Marvel movie, and this is a fight that comes down to endings. Yeah, not that one. I don't think there's a filmmaker that uses historical juxtaposition and context as well as Spike Lee. The ending of Black Klansman is a tonal somersault that lands with the ferocity of an artist who is entirely fed up with this shit. Few movies are funnier, certainly no movie is funnier while being this uncomfortable. It captures a moment in time where the first black cop in Colorado Springs, a place that is still to this day 80% white, forms a phone relationship with the Grand Wizard Dragon Ghost of the KKK, David Duke. Which is hilarious and true, except for the title, I just kind of guessed on that one. It takes reasonable artistic liberties to create the atmosphere of the time beyond that. I find this film intoxicating and it brought John David Washington to a much whiter audience. It's a movie that absolutely goes out of its way to say, this is where we are. 
Alas, we have to say goodbye to a Ryan Coogler showstopper, but I have to stick with Spike on this one. It's not a movie for anyone looking for easy answers, and it's a rough watch. Black Panther took this all the way to the waiting moments of the 12th round. It was a hell of a fight, but ultimately it was not to be. Black Klansman takes this fight. At this point, I don't know who stops Fury Road or how, but at some point the winners come down to personal preference. You know, take the Fate 5 movies, fight to the death, it's very deep. See that music's Italian? Yes. <laughs> I'm stalling. Here's the most honest bar for comparison ever. Is Get Out a better horror movie than Fury Road is an action movie? Fury Road is about as high as film difficulty goes. For years, they are just building cars in the desert to make this movie. Years. Movies are not made practically on this scale anymore, with the exception of Christopher Nolan. But even Tofno movies don't look like this. Fury Road is a peerless film. It'll be in the conversation after all of us are gone. It's a piece of history, and it absolutely slaps. Be like Max. Be a good ally. With a heavy heart, we say goodbye to Jordan Peele. Fury Road took just three rounds to best their opponent, and they still won with a murder uppercut. But it was sad this time. <laughs> Sorry, I totally forgot my boxing metaphor microphone. <clears throat> In the red corner, fighting at 6-2 with an apoplectic raccoon is the Guardians of the Galaxy. And it just like the Earth Tones corner or whatever, fighting at 5-6 is the avian Flavian, Lady Bird. I think Guardians of the Galaxy was an extremely fresh breath of air once upon a time. Hey! It isn't Star Prince! A story about a kid who lost his mom and now he's a space pirate who hangs out with the tree in a medical experiment. You know, tale as old as time. Tale as old as time. I really appreciate what Guardians brings to the overall comic sort of zeitgeist. However, Lady Bird feels like one of the realest illustrations of elder millennial angst I've ever seen. It's touching, heartwarming, gut-wrenching, and not to put too fine a point on it, but Laurie Metcalf gives an incredible performance in this movie. Guardians is the most special movie to me in the entire Marvelverse, but Lady Bird is a special movie to me as a person. Well, if you want to read it, we can go down to the public library. I want to read it in bed. That's something that rich people do. We're not rich people. I adore this floundering, gentle portrait of a kid who's just finding herself. Deep in the 10th round, after all the Guardians had exhausted every last bit of firepower they brought with them, Lady Bird simply kinda yawned and was over it. Winner by cataclysmic indifference is the one, the only, Lady Bird. Yeah, this feels right. The absolute stupidest possible Marvel vs. DC fight is uh, the closeout of the round of 16. Let's go. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse feels like a total accident. And it really was. This film entered the public consciousness when development of an animated Spider-Man franchise leaked in the big Sony fiasco. Birdman, conversely, is a small and wonderful exploration of aging and how careers evolve over time. It is, in and of itself, a a wonderful and interesting artistic experience. The whole movie is one shot without being chronologically coherent, which is an accomplishment all unto itself. Birdman exists in its own space, which is also true of Spider-Verse. Conundrums abound. Birdman, you are loved, but early in the second round, Miles called in his team of Spider-Ham-infused reinforcements, and no one can fight that. Birdman fell into existential street jazz time spirals and fell to the mat not long after that. And, uh, not sure how to tell you this. Oh, oh. Spider-Verse won by knockout and the ambulances. Uh, ah, just say it, Michael, just say it. Um, Birdman, uh, didn't make it. Birdman died. Just cut to the ad for next. A 
gate remains standing. We have arrived at the end of our journey, part four. Which is sad because I really enjoyed this, but everything must end. The time has come to crown a favorite of the favorites. And on a personal note, we need silliness now more than ever. World's in a tough spot. My partner told me that this episode and series needs to end on an uplifting note. No more comical doomerism. We got a lot of rebuilding to do. But first, the quarterfinals. There is no way this fight ends in anything other than people being upset. This is an upsetting matchup. I am upset. We knew this was gonna get hard. Here's something you definitely didn't know. But did you know? Parasite was edited in Final Cut Pro 7. Sweeps Week surprised the second But did you know? The idea for this film came to Bong while filming Snowpiercer. He was challenged by a friend and colleague on set to write a play. He had an idea based on his own experiences as a tutor for a wealthy family in his 20s. We're all parasites. But it's not like Knives Out wasn't also a movie about a bunch of parasites. <laughs> Calm down. Okay. Both movies are special and practically one of a kind in execution. They both bring so much to film. Oh, come on, don't ding the Okay, decision. Um, deep in the 12th round, Knives Out had simply run out of stabbing energy. The fighters both collapsed onto one another completely exhausted, but it was Knives Out who buckled first. Parasite hit the mat moments later, but they had already won. Parasite, winner by knockout, and the first to enter the semi-finals. This film is a staggering achievement. Louise wouldn't know what to make of Baby Driver, though it's not like Miles would fare all that well against aliens. He could drive, he could drive the Jeep up. Okay, so two films that are tonally leagues apart must do battle in the birdhouse of my soul to find the favorite of my favorites. Flat out, I will see every single film both Dunny Villeneuve and Edgar Wright make until the end of time. If this matchup were taking place with this year's movies, Last Night in Soho would be standing off against Dune right now and we might be about to have a very different conversation. But in this conversation, Baby Driver is a popcorn cannon. It is the purest celebration of so many different ages of cinema. Edgar Wright lives in perpetual reverence for what has come before in his medium. His understanding of cinema as a medium of art and entertainment is, in my opinion, unrivaled in Hollywood. And it felt really damn incredible to see a thoughtful disability representation in a freaking car movie. However, comma. Arrival is a creation of such love and nuance that just thinking about it makes me want to live in it again. The cinematography is absolutely breathtaking, a stone cold knockout. Humans are terrified, untrusting creatures. These extraterrestrials show up to say, sup, and then all of humanity is like, my god, it's coming right for us. It's not an alien invasion movie in the traditional sense. Arrival has no grand welcome to earth moment. Humans must overcome themselves. I love both films, but deep in the 10th round, Arrival just overpowered the extremely overcaffeinated Baby Driver. Baby fell to the mat and the towel landed next to him not long after that. The ref stopped the fight and held up Arrival's hand. Godspeed, Miles. I don't think art often gets made on the level of Mad Max Fury Road. It's a film that stands out amongst film. 
one of the most riveting experiences I ever had in a movie theater. Black Klansman, in the same breath, is a masterpiece. No one does tone like Spike. But it is time for us to say goodbye and hopefully not get demonetized in the future for putting imagery of the... Uh, uh, uh. That's not why it's going home, it just sounds nice to have that. Films on the execution level of Mad Max Fury Road don't come along ever. None of the other Mad Max movies or anything else George Miller has ever directed is on this level. Sorry babe, pig in the city, I still love you! It is one of the most visually engaging films I've ever seen. In the 12th round, Mad Max Fury Road was just too explosive to deal with. They just started to pull ahead in the fight. Max doesn't get tired. Winner by decision. Adieu, Spike Lee. Welcome, friends and friendos, to the most lopsided match of all time. In the blue corner, a CGI love letter to Jack Kirby and found families into the Spider-Verse. And in the taupe corner, that feeling when you know you want and need something but you have no idea what it is, Lady Bird. Booyah. Lady Bird is magnificent, clever, endearing, engaging, and hilariously sort of a hey letter to Sacramento. Lady Bird took out some extremely heavy hitters. What a journey through the bracket she took, but this is where we must part ways. Lady Bird, is that your given name? Yeah. Why is it in quotes? I gave it to myself. It's given to me by me. I've never seen a reaction to a movie like Into the Spider-Verse. Endlessly, relentlessly creative, meaningful artistry. It did something incredible with computer graphics that celebrated the 2D hand articulated art form. I'm in love with this new age of CG pictures, the technology caught up to the creativity. I'm still not quite over how many amazing awesome things this movie did with Spider-Man lore. And I'm equally, sorry to say, still not over the end of The Amazing Spider-Man 2. I know Andrew Garfield's having a garfald or whatever, but the ending of that movie is ass. I've always wanted to say that. Into the Spider-Verse actually said something. A lot of some things. Anyone can be Spider-Man, and their run did not end there. In the seventh round, you could tell that both fighters were tired. Lady Bird simply stated, I don't really want to be here anyway, so... And, and she, pa she passed out. Or is that technically a forfeit? Honestly, this metaphor has gotten so far away from me, I don't... Okay, we said goodbye to four. Surely the next round... <laughs> yeah, we were probably always ending up here. And you know, thanks for hanging out with me as we mercilessly pit all my favorite movies from the last seven years against each other. It made me so happy to see all the movies people are discovering from watching this. Okay, let's get into the first match of the semi-finals. Humans, for the most part, don't have a clue. They don't want one or need one either. They're happy. They think they have a good bead on things. People are smart. They can handle it. The person is smart. People are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. I think this one is going to feel like a cheat, but our favorite movies are the ones that are closest to us. We relate to films for a multitude of reasons. I think a lot of people probably have a strange connection to Parasite they never thought about. I saw this movie in a theater in 2019, and minus Knives Out and Rise of Skywalker, I haven't been to a theater since. Parasite was a revelation in the theater. Its precision is what makes the audience so uncomfortable. And also its grim illustrations of the far-reaching dichotomies of capitalism. It was a wonderful film-going experience for me. I just let a filmmaker take me on a ride with no idea where we were going. I'm glad that that is one of my last theater memories for what will probably be the foreseeable future. But on the other hand, I have a weird relationship with Arrival. 
2017 was a year I never really escaped. I couldn't really sit at a computer for longer than 20 minutes at a time, and I hacked that entire episode together with what I was able to record. It's all out of order, it's all jumbled, like Louise. I felt really close to this movie for a minute, and it was incredible. The loneliness in this movie spoke to me. That was probably the hardest episode of this show to make in retrospect. I sound like I'm choking to death on every word. It feels like a hundred years ago. We bring our own wounds to art. It's what speaks to us. I clearly have a hefty and well-documented infatuation with humanity present in the furthest dimensions of science fiction. Because all science fiction is really just humans commenting on ourselves. The best science fiction is not an objective answer. They're the stories that teach you something about you. Before the fight had even started and ten years after it had long since ended, Arrival landed the blow that knocked Parasite onto the mat for good. Winner by knockout in a temporally confusing manner. Arrival. And now, the least surprising semifinals matchup of all time. We were always going to end here. Now, as for how one is supposed to select a winner here, I'm I'm kind of at a loss. Um, okay, here's a place to start. I absolutely think this is the greatest single shot in a movie of all time. It says everything. Miles' leap of faith into his ascension to become Spider-Man. Both of these movies are impulsive visual grenades. I don't think it would be possible to choose one as a favorite on visuals alone. And I think this one comes down solely to what each movie meant to me. One is an introduction of a beloved comic book character, and, and one is a resurrection. And I'm pretty sure beloved is too strong a word to use on a Mel Gibson vehicle from the 80s. Unfair statement incoming. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is the best Spider-Man movie ever made. Comic book movies nowadays come with baggage and, oddly, homework, so that weighs against Into the Spider-Verse in a slightly unfair way. Even typing the words Spider-Man right now gives me hides. As of writing this, right now, December 2021, I gotta go with George Miller here. I don't think we will see a filmmaker top this in our lifetimes, unless, of course, George tops himself with that whole Furiosa thing. A movie explicitly about a group of people declaring that they are not things to be owned and abused, and the wayward lizard eater that helps them escape. Taylor's the last time. In the tenth round, Mad Max and his band of weirdos overpowered the various and diverse Spider-Men. The entire audience held his breath as Miles fell to the mat. Mad Max Fury Road, winner by knockout. Which brings us to... And here we are, the finals. It should end here. This channel had its first growth spurt because of the Fury Road episode, and we already kind of talked about my state of being during the Arrival episode, and movies that are close to us are the ones that stick with us. I'm glad these are the final two standing. Which brings us to... Well gosh, Louise versus Max. What a lovely, lovely day. In the blue corner, a thoughtful meditation on loss and non-linear existences, Dunny Villeneuve's Arrival. And in the teal and orange corner, an action movie that also made you think about stuff, even if you didn't want to, Mad Max Fury Road. Mad Max Fury Road is one of the best silent films ever made. Crushed it, nailed it. Everything is communicated visually. You don't have to hear any dialogue at all. The script for this movie was a collection of storyboards. Fury Road is a cacophonous tapestry of perfectly executed madness held together with the power of friendship. You know, I thought it'd be harder to say goodbye to Fury Road, but Arrival is just that affecting to me.
It defined part of my life. You arrive as the person you were supposed to be. It's not gentle. It's not sympathetic. You simply arrive. I guess it really is that simple. Arrival is my favorite of my favorites. A movie that empowers grace and knowledge. A movie about win-win situations mutated by the powerful to manipulate the earthly power around them. It's a film about cooperative play, work together, and everyone wins. There is no universally accepted solution to most infinitely complex problems, so the only solution is to work together. Pushing the limits of existence, being who we were always meant to be, to arrive. Arrival wins because it is a non-zero sum game. Okay, this is where you want to get to, right? That is the question. Okay, so first we need to make sure that they understand what a question is. See you next year. <laughs>